carrot men that butter. They all come home over, over the Fraser Street Bridge. And at the bottom of the bridge, there was always young lads hanging about cadging bits of leftover piece. Have you got any bread, sir? I'm nearly dead, sir. <laughs> and, and the island man saying, away home, son, your ma has oranges. <laughs> and, and bits of gab like that. <laughs> but not that evening. Oh, not that evening. That evening, we all come home very quiet. And when we got to the top of the bridge, the, the women come to the doors. And when we got to the top of the bridge, and you looked up that big long street and seen the women standing, and you thought what it was all about. Why, it was a hardy nut indeed that got to the top of Fraser Street that day without lumping his throat. I was little more than a boy then. I've been working in the shipyard for just over a year, but you, when you're young, you think that life will go on forever. <sighs> It's all right for the, the minister to talk about the everlasting kingdom and all that, but like, when you're young, it doesn't apply to you. Because you think you'll live forever. But when I heard about the Titanic, that vast ship, those well riveted beams all sliding into none. When I heard about the Titanic, that was the first time it dawned on me that one day I too would lie. Damn. started to work in the Titanic, hasn't she really gotten her feet? <laughs> Ugh, you'd think she was the Queen of China or something. Aye, and it's not two years since she had an issue in her foot. Aye, but now, with her eldest, Anna's far earning good money in the Titanic. You know what she's got? A real linen pulling down blind. What? None of your old paper ones for sissy now. Huh? And here, real wallpaper on the walls. Instead of paint like the rest of us. <laughs> and she's got real cups and saucers. And here, do you know what else she's got? What? She's even got a square of oil cloth in her lavatory, so she does. <laughs> oil cloth, like I have in the crew quarters on Titanic. What? Like the oil cloth in the Titanic? Aww. Where did she buy that? <laughs> Who said anything about buying? It's not just like the oil cloth and Titanic. It's exactly the same. <laughs> and she got real cups and saucers right enough. With the crest of the White Star Line <laughs> all over them. Knocked off. Knocked off. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you must be joking. You see, sitting in her house, it's like travelling first class to New York. <laughs> Don't you know? <laughs> One of these days, a captain's going to come round and say, Can I have my anchor back? <laughs> Oh, I'd love to see inside her house right enough. Oh, do you mean you haven't been invited? No. You mustn't be one of the chosen few. <laughs> a real society lady she is these days, so she is. Inviting half the world in. Oh, you must come round this evening for a wee cup and saucer full of tea. <laughs> <laughs> Here, she's coming now. Here you've got a score oil cloth in your lavatory these days. Oh, I have indeed. It's that lad of mine. Since he started to work on the Titanic, he wants a bit more style about the place. Mm -hmm. huh. Here's my heart broke. Where do you see this? This 
What is the next of his ideas? What is it? It's a gas mantle. What's a gas mantle? A gas mantle is for letting more light in the house. Uh, you put it over a gas jet and it lets out a lovely light. Oh, you can see into every corner of the room oh. if you have a gas mantle. Well, what oh, what mantle? Mind you, it takes you to have your house corn clean if you oh, want to use a gas sure. mantle. Exactly. <laughs> oh, but sure, you and Georgina come around and have a wee cup and saucer full of clay. <laughs> and you can see for yourselves. Aye. Times have changed right enough. I was just saying to myself, as I was sitting on the electric train... What? The Is this the next of your madness? Were you actually on an electric train? I was indeed. <laughs> and what was it like? An electric train? Why? An electric train is just the same as a horse train. Only there's no horses. Ach, but what did you think of them, sissy? Electric trains? Oh, sorry. Ach, they're just a passing fed. They'll never catch on. No, electric trains is all right, but they'll never replace the horse trains. They'll never replace the horse trains. There speaks the universal voice of man in the face of he knows not what. And this lady will pay. For three days, she will stand at Royal Avenue until at last she sees in the sad lists of those who perished the name of an apprentice son. A high price to pay for a few shreds of grandeur. A daughter-in-law who will never be, grandchildren who will exist only in the imagination. Oh, if only the wheel could spin back. Sadly, not to be. Enjoy yourself, dear lady. Your sad hour is yet to be. Oh, electric trams are just a passing fed. They will never catch on. Electric trams is all... In your honour, ladies, <clears throat> I will recite you a poem whose sources is lost in the mists of antiquity. A tale of savage passion and revenge. In a main abode on the Shankle Road lived a man named William Bloke. He had a wife, the bane of his life, and she always got on her goat. <laughs> Till one day at dawn, with her nightdress on, he slit her bloody throat. <laughs> now, he was glad he done what he had, as she said, they're stiff and still, till suddenly all of the angry law filled his soul with an awful chill. Oh, so to finish the fun, so well begun, he decided himself to kill. Oh, no. So he took the sheet from his wife's cowl feet and he twisted it into a rope and he hung himself from the pantry shelf. It was an easy end, let's hope. And as he faced his death with his dying breath, he solemnly cursed the Pope. <laughs> <laughs> the main concern of the whole concern, it's only just beginning. Because he went to hell, but his wife got well and she's still alive and sinning. For the razor blade was German made, but the sheep was damn fast living. <laughs> Style. I think that's what I learned most about my time in Europe. A sense of style. Back in the States there was vitality and plenty of money, but it was all raw. The man spat on the floor and they drank their whiskey straight. It was all very different in Europe. There was a sense of graciousness there that was sadly lacking back home. In Rome, wherever we wandered, there seemed to be the ruins of ancient Rome on every street corner. And in Paris, well, there were the artists and their girlfriends, and we had the most wonderful meals. And London, I really liked London. The Tar, that grim grey place where the little princes were murdered. There was nothing like that back in the States. Just a bleak rawness. 
I even met the old king, a charming old gentleman. They say he had an eye for the ladies. <laughs> My husband was heavily involved in the financial aspects of the Titanic and we had occasion to visit Belfast many times as guests of Harland and Wolfe. We were also their guests on the fatal voyage. The loss of the mighty ship has haunted the long years of my widowhood. For the most part, the men who built her were serious and hard-working and some with that weakness for alcohol which sometimes accompanies a religious approach to life. On the slip, the Titanic was a dark leviathan which towered over its puny little builders. In the water, the Titanic was the epitome of luxury, the embodiment of wealth. The collision with the iceberg shattered my life. The worldly, shallow young matron became a widow whose thoughts ran on deeper lines. To my mind, there is a spiritual quality to the story of the Titanic, a harsh tale straight from the Old Testament, when Moses came down from Mount Sinai to find the Israelites worshipping false gods. Retribution was terrifying in its intensity. The Edwardians of the British Empire were the chosen people of their day. The Titanic, the marvel of its age, was the golden calf of its day. Was its loss due to chance and circumstance? Or was its loss the work of a jealous God? A beautiful day, the sea like glass. And as usual, lunch on board the Titanic is a leisurely business. But even as the waiters dodge among the tables, oh, to speak with the benefit of hindsight, in 1912, even elementary precautions such as lifeboat drills were unheard of. After today, liners would use a more southerly route to New York, maintain radio alert 24 hours a day, carry out regular ice patrols and slacken speed. In the meantime, he must play the cards as they are dealt, take his place in history without hindsight. The lights are going out. They must be having a rough time down below. Mr. Murdoch! My compliments, pass my congratulations and thanks to the chief engineer. Inform him that all engine room and boiler room personnel must prepare to evacuate the ship. Very good, sir. But one thing more, sir. All the women and children are not off the ship. Some of them must have been... The lights are going out. About the women and children. 2.20 a.m. Too late, Mr. Murdoch. Far, far, far too late. There are no flowers on a sailor's grave. No lilies on an ocean wave. The only tribute is the seagull's sweep and the teardrops on a loved one's cheek. She's at 90 degrees. Stern sticking straight up into the sky with three propellers a hundred feet out of the water. Men will write books and stories and poems about this. <clears throat> the greatest ship of the time, which sinks on her maiden voyage. A hundred years from now, people may flock to Belfast to see where she was built. A few days after the tragedy, a notice was posted outside the White Star offices at Southampton. It was a message to the relatives of the crew, most of whom came from Southampton.
my fellow sufferers, my heart overflows with grief for you all, and is laden with the sorrow that you are weighed down with, and which this terrible tragedy has thrust upon you. May God be with us and comfort us all. Oh.